grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God in Jesus our Lord. Welcome. I'm glad to see you here on this auspicious Sunday, the 4th of July, the 246th sixth, sixth anniversary of our nation's founding. Not after the war of the revolution, but before the war of the revolution, we declared our independence as a free people. The people are in charge. Those that we, that we pay their salaries, they work for us. Would that they would remember that. <laughs> Having lived on the government dole for 22 years and now in retirement, I still believe that. Uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here. As you, as you know, Pastor Larry's taking the Sunday off. I'm here. You're here. We'll get through this. And uh, you come back next Sunday and hear a good sermon from Pastor Larry. Bring somebody with you. Okay, what are the announcements for today? We have announcements. Yes. Today, oh, yes. Today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Do I need to go through this? Any, any visitors here? Everybody know what we're doing? You lift up the first... There's a little cellophane, clear. Lift that up first, get the bread. Lift up the second one, get the wine. Fruit of the vine. Grape juice in the Cumberland Church's table. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are invited. We want you to take communion with us. We want you to. We desire that you do that. Communion today. Marvin Rogers has a birthday on July the 6th. When you see Marvin, give him a happy birthday, pat him on the back, hug his neck. Monday, always home, uh, the uh, match for the homeless at 3 o'clock in the basement. Wednesday morning, 11 o'clock, intercessory prayer here in the sanctuary. You are invited. And then next Sunday, we will begin a class in the fellowship hall Pastor Larry is going to be leading a class on what we believe as Cumberland Presbyterians. If you've been a lifelong Cumberland Presbyterian, or if you are just now coming to the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, you might be interested to come to this to see what we believe, what we say we believe, what we practice, and how we practice it. It's a four-week class next Sunday during Sunday school hour. Please come and be a part of it. Is there any other? Ah, yes, and also next Sunday. Yay, the choir is coming back. Next Sunday after church. Next Sunday after church, the choir will rehearse. And hopefully soon we'll be singing again together. Next Sunday after church, choir practice. Anything else? Let us worship God.
call to worship today is from Paul's letter to the Galatian church where he writes, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let us pray. Our gracious and merciful God, you sent Jesus to eat and drink with sinners. By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, lead us to your table today and be present with us even though we are weak and sinful people. In this time of worship, we want to know the nourishment of your forgiving love and the empowerment of your mighty spirit within us. By our worship, we praise you. And by our lives, we serve you. We worship you now in the all-powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us stand to sing hymn number 599, God of Our Father. And you'll notice that there's that little uh, trumpet fanfare before each verse. <laughs> seated and it's time for the children to come and have their special time good morning Becky <laughs> you doing okay you know what today is the 4th of July 
All right, so we have, have you shot off any fireworks yet? A little spring? <laughs> we heard them all night and my dog shivered all night, uh, but he'll, he shivers at anything, so he, he's okay. He was inside and they were all safe, uh, all, the, all his buddies. Uh, this right here, we know we have the American flag. Okay, we see this lots everywhere because we live in America. And you know, a lot of, uh, the, part of the flag has lots of different uh, meanings and symbols. Do you know any of them? Do you, yet? Yes? That's right, 50 states, 50 stars. Is it 13 stripes, yes. Yes, good job. And then also the colors uh, have a little meaning too, and there's lots of different meanings, but I went with the basic, and the, you know, the white was uh, to represent purity and innocence. The blood, uh, the red, is for valor or the bravery of the men and women that shed their blood, that died for our freedoms. And then the blue is for justice, okay? And so as an American citizen, uh, we, because of uh, th those that fought, and died for our freedom, we get lots of freedoms today. We have freedom of speech, we, have, we are free to tell our opinion, we have free to assemble, to gather, okay? We have freedom of religion, we can, we can go and worship God the way we want to. And there's other freedoms too uh, in our country. And you know, back in the day, in 1776, we, it was Independence Day from the King of England. And so every 4th of July, we celebrate that, and it's wonderful. And um, right here is another flag. Are you familiar with this one? We don't, uh, give you a hint too. Both flags are in the room. If you, <laughs> I, I, I did the, I did the uh, pictures right here because we don't want to all crane our necks to look at the, the flag. So this is the Christian flag, okay? And this came a little later in our history. And um, this, the cross, what do you think? What does that mean? Yeah, Christ, Jesus' blood that died on uh, the cross for our sins, okay? He, he shed his blood. And the blue is for he is loyal and he is faithful and also it can represent, you know, him being baptized. And the white is for purity and for peace, ultimate peace. You know, he's the one that brings ultimate peace to us. And, uh, and also, you know, as a, you know American citizen, we have lots of freedom, but... As we're heaven citizenship, uh, we have freedom, freedom of our sins, okay? Because sin, it can enslave us, sin can bring us down and, and hold us. But God, because he shed his blood for us, he died on the cross and he made us free. And the way we accept that and to get that freedom, to gain that freedom, is to accept him as our king in our life and our Lord and his free gift of salvation. And so what's wonderful about this is this citizen is all over the world. You know, we got brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world, and it's wonderful. It's both to have dual citizenship, right? And it's K, and it's wonderful. And so, the, you know, we celebrate 4th of July for the Independence Day for America, and we can celebrate uh, our heavenly citizenship the moment you accept Christ in your heart. And that could be different for everybody. And those are just wonderful things to... Uh, for have freedom. So uh, freedom of sin is the best thing ever, okay? So just remember, uh, there's lots of freedoms, and Christ gives us the freedom of our sins. So let's bow our heads. And dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for freeing us from our sins. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be citizens of heaven. And in Jesus' name, amen. Him. Number 67. Oh God, our house in ages past.
As we come to the Lord's table, we are mindful of our sins. And even though we believe and affirm that Jesus saves us eternally from all our sins, it behooves us daily to confess our sins afresh to God, not so much that God knows it, but that we know it, and that we know that we need God's mercy in our lives. We begin with the unison prayer, together praying aloud and then in silence our individual prayers of confession knowing that as we are honest with God God will forgive our sins the call to confession is David's great affirmation of his own sinfulness in Psalm 51 have mercy on me O God according to your unfailing love according to your great compassion blot out my transgressions Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Let us pray. Almighty God, we wish to be clean. Clean in thought, word, and action. We cannot do this on our own and the stains won't wear out by themselves or fade with time. They can only be removed by your forgiveness. They can only be erased by your grace. They can only be cleansed by the sacrificial blood of Christ. So we pray in faith, asking that once again, you will make us clean. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can burst. Boast. Brothers and sisters, hear the gospel. Believe the good news. In Jesus' name, our sins are forgiven. Thank God Almighty. Amen. The call to give this morning is in 2 Corinthians, Paul's second, second letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 8, verse 7. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. We like to pat ourselves on the back, don't we, about all we've done and all we are. Just look at all we do for you, Lord, we sometimes want to say. Just look at how I've helped build your church here. Why, God, you couldn't do without me in your church. We like to think that, don't we? But there's one area of life where I and I think most Christians need to be mindful of our need of grace even more. And that's in giving. What does it mean to make a meaningful offering? What happens when you give that meaningful offering? I've known people that said, I'm not going to give any more to the church because the session just wastes my money. Once you are mindful of your proper gift, and once you've given it in faith, you've done your part. Now the error or the blessing of how it's used is up to the session. But first, God, thank you for saving me and making me a part of your church that I can help spread the gospel and now may I meaningfully give you a gift to make it so all over the world. 
with joy in your hearts for what God has done for you. Let's give God his tithe and our morning offering. Our gracious God, we thank you for your continuing providential care of each of us, even when we complain about our trivial cares and problems. In gratitude for your undeserved grace and unlimited opportunity, we dedicate this offering to your glory. We yearn to know that our lives and our resources are building the body of Christ among us and in our world. We desire to be of greater service to your church in this place. Allow us in this offering and by our efforts to bring hope and grace and love to all who are in desperate need of the Savior. Bless all we give to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We take time now to read God's holy word and we begin with Joshua chapter 5 and then in St. Luke's and St. John's gospel chapter 8. Now everybody seems to know where St. John's gospel is because it's the fourth book in the New Testament. So you may stick your finger back there in John as we discover where Joshua is. Oh. It's hard enough to remember who Joshua was, much less know where his book is. Well, it's very easy. If you'll start in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the next book, Joshua. Turn to Joshua, chapter 5. We're going to read just a very few verses of Joshua, chapter 5. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And then in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 31 to 36. 
To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, If you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord for you, the people of God. We join our hearts and minds now together in a time of prayer. And as always, you're invited to see the folks who've asked for our prayers listed in the prayers the prayer list. I hope you'll take the bulletin home with you so that you can pray for these people each and every day. And as always here in the Oak Ridge Church, we give you the opportunity to name a person or a subject out loud at the beginning of the silent prayer so that we can all be aware of their need of prayer. Let us join together as we pray and we'll conclude with our Lord's Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge you to be the bread of heaven, the word of truth, and the author of life. Lord Jesus, feed us, teach us, and fit us for eternity. We come to you now with our many needs. Some here are burdened with a decision that must be made even, there, even though there seems to be no good outcome, no matter what is chosen. Some hear battle addictions that by themselves they cannot win. Help us who have socially acceptable addictions to not look down on those who suffer, both from addiction and public ridicule. Some here are experiencing a loss that will make the rest of their days upon the earth a struggle to find normalcy again. Right here in this fellowship for which you endured Calvary's cross are broken relationships and feelings of superiority and inferiority. Whatever the cause of our brokenness, give us your Holy Spirit to mend it. No matter what our position is in this congregation, and no matter how long or short our time of membership has been, allow us a proper acknowledgement that all of us are sinners saved by grace. Too often amid the ruts and routines of daily American life, we have no desire to celebrate, no reason to be joyous, no cause to express gratitude. Lift us up, Lord Jesus, and fill us once again with your gracious promise that you are always with us. Also, we come today asking for your providential care of others. We look at our prayer list, and we wonder about each person. Some realize their need of you, and some are completely oblivious, like us. Some of them believe because of their youth or their influence in this community or their family connections or half-hearted attachment to your church that you owe them redemption from present predicaments. Bring them back, Lord Jesus. Bring them back to the reality that if they would truly live a worthy life, it must be lived following you. 
barge through the tiniest opening they give you and permeate their lives with your loving grace as you have within each of us. O oh God, how we praise your name for hearing our prayers, not only what we say, but the desires of our hearts. We end this prayer in the words you taught all who follow you to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. truly beautiful, wonderful. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almost from the very moment that Pastor Larry asked me to fill in for him today, I determined that I wanted to deliver this sermon in your hearing. It is for me an affirmation of what it means to be a Christian 
in the United States. And then the world intervened. The news media talks about all of the things that go on in our country, all of the things that we as Christian Americans don't like, don't believe, and would like to change, but it keeps on. And so my fear as weeks began to be days, and even during this very week, when it was too late to change the bulletin, I wondered, should I stand behind this sacred desk and deliver this sermon? You see, I am a traditional person. I believe in the Bible. It is the inspired word of God. All of it. And I don't understand a whole lot of it. My earlier conviction was, well, just forget about that. Just eliminate that. You will rarely, if ever, hear me preach a sermon from the book of Revelation. I don't have a clue as to what that really, really, <laughs> truly means. I take God's grace firmly in hand when Jesus is recorded in the gospel saying that no one knows the day or the hour. And when we try to interpret it, as so many have through the ages, well, you know. So what does it mean to be a dedicated Christian and a dedicated American? I do not want to cause you anger. I do not want you to think any less of me. But my hope, my prayer will be and is that it cause you as it has caused me to consider again what it means to live as a free man of God in the United States. Our nation's founding documents proclaim we are one nation under God. I believe that. But did you know that, or since the most of you are like me and you were living in the 1950s, do you remember in the 1950s that it was General of the Army and later President Eisenhower who added under God? One nation under God. I believe not only is the United States one nation under God, but also our world is one nation under God. Even though the world may not be aware of it. As you know, if you've been here in times past when I've been given the privilege of proclaiming the gospel, you know that I spent the most of my ministry as an army chaplain. 22 years, 7 months, and 26 days. And only in those 22 years, 7 months, and 26 days, only 7 months of those days, years in the army, was I in harm's way. I was the 1st Brigade Chaplain of the 101st Airborne Air Assault Division who got the privilege of leading the ground phase of Operation Desert Storm. Within minutes of the declaration of the ground phase of the war, I and the rest of the 1st Brigade were on helicopters going very low and very fast from Saudi Arabia into Iraq. But there's always a fly in the ointment, isn't there? We had tried our best to practice 
and make sure we knew exactly what we were going to do when we invaded Iraq. But the fly in the ointment for us was an NBC news crew. They showed up with authority to get on our helicopters and go in to Iraq with us. Now, by Geneva Convention and Congressional law, I am a non-combatant. I don't carry a weapon. So, when we were practicing getting on and getting off the helicopter, you can well understand that I was one of the first ones on so that I would be the last one off. You don't want a guy just carrying a cross <laughs> to get off the helicopter first. You want somebody with an M16. The M16s didn't get that way that day. I won't tell you what the sergeant major said once the NBC News crew and their gear was on the helicopters. It's not church language. <laughs> but he looked at me in great frustration and said, Get on the helicopter, <laughs> chaplain. So I did. And lo and behold, I'm not in the middle. I'm at the door. As we're lifting off, the crew chief says to me, Chaplain, when you feel the helicopter's skids hit the sand, push this lever. The door will pop open. Run. Okay. I did. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that I'm the farthest out from the helicopter. All the people with weapons are to my rear. My first conscious thoughts in the sand of Iraq was, Dear Lord, we just invaded Iraq, and they don't know it. Just prior to getting on the helicopter, a reporter saw me and saw that I was a lieutenant colonel, but then he also saw that I had on a cross. And he said, you're a chaplain. And I said, yes, I am. And he says, what are you doing here? I'm going with my men. There's going to be danger ahead. We think Saddam may give you a dose of biological warfare. We had a huge hypodermic that every soldier carried. That if, if you were to get in biological warfare, you were supposed to take that and stab yourself in the thigh. There wasn't a one soldier that said that he had the courage to with that hypodermic. Thankfully we didn't have to do that. But he says to me, the reason for this long story about going into Iraq, the reason he wanted to know is, is God on our side? And he sticks his microphone in front of me with the cameras running and says, Chaplain, is God on our side? I'm not a very good dancer, but I can sure tap dance when it, the need arises. <laughs> but I think in the spur of the moment, I came up with a God-given answer. Is God on our side? God is always looking for his people. No matter where they live, no matter where you are in the world, God wants you. I think this has always been so. Joshua certainly experienced that. Wasn't that an interesting snippet in Joshua 5 that I read? Let me quickly relate the whole story so that you'll know what's going on. Moses had died, and now his aide, Joshua, was the leader of the people. And now they were 
just a stone's throw away from the promised land. Think about it. This had all started with Abraham hundreds of years ago. God had promised him that he and his descendants would inherit the promised land. Do you know how much of the promised land Abraham had when he died? He had a graveyard for himself and his wife Sarah. That's all. Hey God, you said you'd give us the promised land. How about fulfilling that promise? Well, now it's about to happen. There's only one problem. Jericho stands in the way. Jericho, that walled city, has to be taken before the people can go into the promised land. And the night before the conquest begins, Joshua, like every good commander, is out looking at his troops. And he happens to pause and stop as he's looking over the city and he sees someone that he doesn't know. And so he asks him, are you a friend or are you a foe? The way that happens in the United States Army is by challenge and password. The challenge and password through the years of my experience were sometimes pretty good, but oftentimes they were just cutesy. I remember one time when the password, the challenge and the password had to total the number seven. So the person who gives the challenge has only to give these numbers. One, six, two, five, three, four, four, three, five, two, six, one, seven, zero. It's all. So you shout out seven. The proper response is zero. I walked the perimeter with the company commander during that exercise. He said, you can see the soldiers and how they act when they don't know you're around, chaplain. <laughs> so we walked the perimeter about midnight. We are coming up to a position and a weak, teenaged male voice says, five! And the commander says, two. Total silence. Again, the weak teenage male voice says, six. The commander says, one. And there's now another pause. And you know he's just about to say something else when the commander says, look. You've been given the challenge and the password. What are you supposed to do now, soldiers? Well, he recognizes the commander's voice and he knows the correct answer when the commander's voice is that way. Yeah, cutesy. But not in Desert Storm. The challenge and password were good old American words. Hamburgers, hot dogs. Basketball, football, good old everyday American words that everybody knows. What is patriotism? Every generation of Americans must decide again who is for us and who's against us. You've heard that Arab proverb over and over. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 10, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, which reminds us all, me especially, that patriotic Americans need not look, think, or act like me to be a patriotic American. Francis Scott Key, an early American patriot, gives us a good example to follow. 
Did you know that he is buried in the city cemetery in Frederick, Maryland? Frederick, Maryland is also famous for another reason. In Frederick, Maryland, there is an army post called Fort Detrick. American chaplains say that being at Fort Detrick is like being the chaplain at a medical school because we do all sorts of high-powered medical research at Fort Detrick. I was the chaplain at Fort Detrick from 1981 to 1984. As I was leaving Fort Detrick, I was given a flag that had flown over the post headquarters at Fort Detrick, over the capital of the United States, and the grave of Francis Scott Key. He is, as you are, I'm sure are aware, is the author of our national anthem, The Star-Spangled Banner. He took seriously the response and the responsibilities of being a Christian and an American. On the night of 1314 September 1814, during the War of 1812, he undertook a mission to exchange a captured British officer for an American physician, Dr. William Bean. During that long night, out in the Chesapeake Bay on an American ship, he waits through the long night for the sun to come up. And he hopes to see with the dawn's early light the American flag still flying in Baltimore. That is why the first verse ends with a question. Most people don't know that. <laughs> it is a question that confronts every American generation. Will we be strong enough to keep freedom's flag flying? Will we remain one nation under God? The anthem was originally meant to be a hymn of thanks for the rescue of Baltimore. It does not glorify battle, war, or conquering other people. Instead, it offers up gratitude to God for the unexpected salvation. Our nation is ever beginning a new day. Our national elections are a good example. Did you know around the time of the change of presidents there is compiled what the sarcastic Americans among us call the plum book. The plum book holds 8,600, 8,600 positions that change because the president has changed. It is more jobs changed peacefully than in most dictator takeovers. By that, we affirm that we are one nation under God. In my old age, I have on occasion substitute taught in the school system of Lenore City. One day I was asked to go and teach American history. I know American history. I feel comfortable teaching American history. Not math, not chemistry, and certainly not physics. But I went into the classroom that day and as I looked around the walls, the teacher had pictures of various leaders of the world and a quote from them. And there in the back corner was a picture of Adolf Hitler. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. I asked each class that day if they understood what that meant. Not one class understood. I invoke one people, 
Ein Reich. One nation. Ein Führer. Most of them got close to that. One leader. And so my question was, is that true of the United States? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We are one people, yes. We are one nation, yes. But we are not a nation of one leader. No, uh-uh. Not ever. You only have to read the Constitution to understand that. I invite you to get a copy of the Constitution and read it again during these patriotic days. I invite you to consider again the allegiance that every military officer makes to the Constitution. Part of what every army officer, military officer affirms is, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You see, it does not matter to the military who the president is. It bugs me no end to hear the national media talk about the president's generals. They are not the president's generals. They are the country's generals. They pledge not to the president, but to the Constitution. And we have, after the Constitution, those glorious first ten amendments that we call, what? The Bill of Rights. So a question that I ask each class is, what's the difference between a right and a privilege? I say to them, it is a privilege, not a right, to drive on the roads of the state of Tennessee. A privilege can be taken away, not a right. Where do the rights come from? From God. And the First Amendment says it ever so clearly. Let me read it to you. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Therein that First Amendment is the reason why there will always be a chaplaincy in the military as long as the Constitution is the founding document and the document that we affirm as Americans. You see, you can have a religion or no religion, and the chaplain is there to help you practice it. <laughs> At Fort Dietrich one day, a first sergeant in one of the companies, the first sergeant is the lead NCO in the company, uh, a, a first sergeant called me up and he says, Chaplain, I'm going to send so-and-so over to see you. Why are you doing that, first sergeant? Because he wants me to let him off in the days ahead to practice uh, the, uh, what he calls Passover. I said, you don't need to send him over, first sergeant. You have to give him off. No, sir. I'm not going to give him off. What would happen if somebody else came along and said they wanted off on Christmas? I'd say, let him go because this guy is going to work on Christmas. Oh, he'd never thought of that. I said, you can't be both. You can't be Jewish and Christian. If you're going to be Jewish, you practice Passover. If you're Christian, you practice Christmas. The Jew works on Christmas. The Christian works on Passover. That's the freedom found in the First Amendment. I challenge us all to think about all of God's blessings in our lives, especially as Christian Americans. That great hymn that we sing around Thanksgiving says it so beautifully. Count your many blessings, see what God has done, and it will surprise you. 
So I ask you to look beyond your petty cares and troubles and see God's blessings everywhere. Thankfully, we are one nation under God. And I conclude by praying a prayer that was written by our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Let us pray. Lord, give us faith that right makes might. Grant, O merciful God, that with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as you give us to see the right, we may strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I ask you now to take the bulletin and follow along with me in the liturgy for Holy Communion. Matthew's Gospel records our Lord saying in chapter 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Brothers and sisters, here at the table of the Lord, all of us weary, sin-filled people can come and find not only rest, but eternal salvation and sustenance for the journey. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, as we stand before this communion table, we are keenly aware that our deepest need is for your redeeming grace. Help us to see our faults clearly and to be willing to exchange them for newness of life. As we eat this bread and drink this cup, teach us to remember that our salvation cannot be obtained through any goodness of our own, but must be accepted as a gift of your free grace. Help us to recall the many grace-filled memories that stir in our hearts at this moment. In this moment of consecration, we ask your blessings on these symbols of the broken body and shed blood of our Savior. May they truly be spiritual food for our spiritual bodies. May this supper open our eyes and ears to your presence. Allow us again to have a vision of your leading spirit in us and in this congregation. Let us live to be of service to you and to all humanity. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The gospel records, on the night of his betrayal and death, our Lord took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. The gospel also records, then in the moments just before the supper was over, he took a cup and pitcher of wine, and as he poured it in, his, in their presence, he reminded them that just as the wine was poured out, so would his blood be poured out for the remission of sins of many people. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God, Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him by faith with thanksgiving. We take the bread now. This symbolizes for us the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. This symbolizes for us the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us pray. Loving God, you graciously feed us who have received these holy mysteries with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. For you have made us your own people by the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, in whose name we give you praise. Amen. Our hymn is number 581, Lord Dismiss Us With Your Blessing. Let us stand together as we sing. today. I pray that you'll come back next week and bring someone with you. Let us receive God's blessing and benediction. The Lord bless you and take care of you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and dwell with you forever. Amen. Amen.